Hello, everyone. Welcome to the virtual happy half hour. We'll be getting started here in just a minute. And as we wait for everyone to join, just a reminder that today's webinar will be recorded and sent to participants after the session today. And you can also find previous recordings of our webinar series at our website, brooksgroup.com. All right, hello everyone and welcome to the virtual happy half hour for Friday, October 30th. It is the Halloween edition and we are dealing with an especially scary topic, virtually planning a 2021 that will be partially virtual. And uh, tomorrow is Halloween, like so many things, uh, it's going to be completely different than uh, what we're used to and planning for next year is likely going to be the same as well. I'm Michelle Richardson. I run our Sales Performance Research Center here uh, at the Brooks Group. I am joined as always by Russ Scherer in California, uh, our Director of Sales Strategy Effectiveness. We have a special guest that we'll be introducing in just a moment. But for now, hello Russ and welcome. Hi Michelle, great to be here for, uh, what is this, number 20, I believe, isn't it, it of is. our uh, virtual happy half hours? It is, um, it is. And again, for those of you who are new to the to the webinar, we focus these around topics that um, that our listeners suggest. So if you've got ideas for future webinars, we'd encourage you to, to chat them or, or put it up in the Q&A. Uh, but today we're going to talk about planning 2021, uh, which uh, is difficult. If you, um, if you saw the numbers out yesterday, uh, we had uh, great growth in the third quarter. Um, we are back within, you know, from a GDP perspective, three and a half percent from where we were with February. Uh, but I think wherever you sit, it's different. And however you see the future, it's different. And in that kind of environment, you've got to plan 2021. So uh, that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, we'll look at kind of, you know, what are, what are your peers thinking uh, about uh, the whole situation? And then we'll talk a little bit about how do we pick some best practices and uh, as requested last week, we'll talk a little bit more in detail about how do you negotiate your number, whether you're a sales leader or um, uh, maybe even a salesperson. So um, with that, Michelle, uh, we are sponsored today by uh, a program called Sales Territory Planning. We'll talk more about that in just a minute, but it's an offering we have, a virtual class uh, that I think is really effective and powerful for sales leaders uh, to build the data, not only around the plan for this year, but more importantly, to give you a uh, I used to call it a roadmap, but now I'm calling it a Google map route uh, of where you are at any moment in the year and getting from this point to where you really want to go. So, uh, but before we talk more about that, Michelle, uh, why don't you introduce our guest and uh, uh, let's move forward. Sounds good. So as Russ mentioned, it is our 20th episode or webisode as I have called it. And so we felt like we needed to celebrate cake and ice cream, not really good during COVID. So we are bringing in a special guest. Uh, we're gonna shake things up a little bit. So we're really excited to have Lisa Rose join us. She is a group vice, vice president of sales here at the Brooks Group. She's been here about 10 years and works with enterprise clients across multiple industries. Uh, she's, she's seen clients doing really, really well in this uh, environment and those that um, like many, out there are struggling. So many of you maybe already know Lisa from your own sales effectiveness journey. Uh, if you don't, it's a great time to get to know her. And uh, as we were preparing for this week's webinar, you know, we've been sharing a lot of data with you over the last few months. And I know Lisa's been talking to clients on a daily basis. So we thought this could really help uh, bring some life and some color and some stories to uh, to what's happening out there and give you all some insight into what's happening uh, with organizations. So with that, Lisa, what are we hearing? What's going on with your clients? Well, I have the opportunity to talk with sales leaders, VPs of sales every day. And um, what I'm hearing is in keeping with the theme. It's spooky, it's scary, and then you add in elections, right? <laughs> So <laughs> yeah, I feel like I should be singing some Halloween songs. Right now, so. <laughs> <I know. laughs> well, that's how they're looking at 2021 as well. Um, 
you know, what I'm hearing really runs along three uh, similar themes. Uh, the first one is budgeting. So we have no idea what next year holds. So how, do, how in the heck do I ever set a budget for what's gonna go across the full year and then be expected to deliver? So there's a lot of negotiation going on there. The other one is adopting work from home long-term. You know, I think in the beginning we thought, okay, maybe it'll be three months, maybe six months, but now some organizations are looking about how do we do all this long-term? We could go, you know, through a half or three quarters of next year. So how do we do that? And the other one is upskilling and training. You know, initially we saw a lot of people, it was very quiet here. There were a lot of crickets and we weren't talking to people much about um, uh, how to upskill their team because they thought it was temporary. But um, now we're starting to talk more and more about it and people are realizing that that, that is a need. Yeah, and you know, I think that you know, Lisa, I just uh, Sorry, I just, I just add to that, Lisa, that uh, I was on the phone this morning with a client out of Europe and uh, Spain just this week announced uh, that they expect that they're going to keep their, um, uh, their regulations around connections and uh, working from home, et cetera, in place until May. Uh, and yeah. so again, this, this is, we're, you know, we're maybe halfway through that. I hate to say that, that, that breaks my heart to say it, but we're maybe halfway through this. Yeah. I think we all want to remain hopeful, but you, you know, there, you have to prepare for the reality uh, of what is 2021. And I think you all talked about last week, how that, you know, the best approach may be to go quarter by quarter and see how things are evolving, but mm -hmm. you just know, you don't know. So, um, but in terms of approach overall, I think if we look at the three different topics that I mentioned, you know, budgeting, budgeting, you know, we have, I've talked to people on different ends of the spectrum. There's some uh, clients I have that sell PPE. They're having extraordinary year um, or others that sell, um, you know, some tubing and connectors that work in IVs that they're using in the, um, in the uh, COVID treatments. So they're having exceptional years. Then you have the other side, you have manufacturing, which is down in certain areas or, or um, industrial sales that are low. So, but those companies still have to stay afloat, right? So the, the PPE related companies are, are trying to figure out, they're trying to moderate what the expectations are for next year because their need may drop off towards the end of the year. And the manufacturing people that, you know, the, the owners of those companies are wanting to set the budgets high. So there's a lot of negotiation going on, on, you know, what is realistic and, and how do you even approach that? In terms of work from home, you know, I think you're, you're talking about a lot of road warriors who are really suffering from Zoom fatigue. You know, they're tired of being in front of the camera. They're, you know, they're working a lot more, they're fitting a lot more meetings in over the course of the day, but they just wanna go out and meet with clients again. And guess what? Some of the clients don't wanna see them. So um, uh, sales leaders are having to navigate that and still motivate people to stay engaged and stay um, keeping their um, the number of meetings up over the course of the day. And of course, I've we're also, talking to people now, but I'm sorry, go ahead, Russ. Uh, and I've also just, uh, again, been hearing from our clients who say, you know, I'll go through and do some planning around what I think is safe for my folks and then things will change, right? So, mm -hmm. so I'll say, okay, well, you can, you know, go out and see people, but kind of have this kind of protection around you or, or be safe in this way. Uh, and then all of a sudden regulations will loosen or they'll get more strict. And so there seems to be this continual change to how, uh, how they get out of their home offices and get out in front of customers too. Well, and it's interesting. Even I had a, a conversation with a client this week that um, you, you want to stick your little toe in the water to take the temperature of the client. You know, I said, I'm going to be, I may be down in Atlanta for a live training in December. How would you feel about meeting? Even if we like sat outside somewhere in a parking lot and, and you know, so you have to kind of carefully, if you are going to get back in on the field, carefully navigate what the comfort area is because mm -hmm. you don't want to come across too aggressive and pushy either. So, and it's hard to plan ahead because we don't even know what next month holds. Yep. So, yeah, yeah. And then clients are, you know, usually at the beginning of the year is an annual kickoff. Um, it's usually a lot of fun for companies and they usually get together and there's a lot of social elements involved in it. And they're looking at the reality, well, we we're, may not be able to do that. So how do we do some training 
in a, what is our virtual annual meeting um, in a very, maybe a short segment in a way that they're, they're getting some skills, but it's still fun. Uh, what can we do to make it fun for people? Because they realize that people are getting a little uh, depressed and demotivated working from home. So I'm talking about them with them about that. Yeah. And upskilling and training, you know, um, I think in the, in the beginning, there was a lot of uh, shaking out of people's skills on that regard. So, you know, some, some more tenured people were resistant the virtual meetings, you know, I'll, I'll call them on the phone, but I'm used to going by, I'm used to selling face to face, you know, how, how do I navigate this? And some of them self-selected um, and said, you know what, this is, might be a good time to retire or take the package. Um, and some of the newer people jumped right into that. Um, I think there was a, a skill set level there that people were getting by on, but, but now if they look towards next year, they're, they're trying to look at how do I take that bar higher? So now I'm using my virtual skills in a more effective way than my competitor, and that can become a differentiator and make it easier for my customers to meet with me. And, mm -hmm. and how, how does the whole sales process that the company has been using evolve to try to accommodate that? Yeah, great information, Lisa. And I think you know, we were talking before about, uh, I think it's really interesting about talking about virtual as a competitive advantage. So being able yeah. to sell. So I think you know, initially it was, how do we just do enough to put a Band-Aid on the whole scenario and keep plugging along? And now it's, how do I take them that much higher? And I know we saw in our data last week, 46% of organizations still see adapting to virtual as a challenge. Um, and, you know, so I think that's really yeah. interesting. It's just not going to go back the same. And I think that really brings us to, to why we're talking about planning for a, a partially virtual year, understanding that we've got to get some clarity around uh, what we're seeing. You know, it's interesting, Michelle, you and I were talking earlier that this really has been, um, maybe not the death, but the coma of the buddy seller, <laughs> right? right. <laughs> so you have to find a way to build that strategic partnership, even like in this PPE company, you know, they're at us all time high. How do you build strategic partnerships with your clients at this point? So it doesn't drop back down and they see you, even though they may have come to you at a time where they had a, a big demand and we're having trouble getting supply. How do they now stick with you and see the value in that partnership? Um, and also, how do you get deeper and wider into these organizations? You know, a lot of the people that, you know, you used to deal with may not be there anymore. And, and so how do you not run that risk of losing your one internal advocate if they go away or retire or leave? Um, how do you get deeper and wider and, and through to the C-suite in these organizations to, to build more of that strategic partnership? Yeah, and I think uh, now more than ever, that really does uh, bring us to the need for planning. And you know, we the buddy seller is the ultimate winger. They're the ultimate go in and, and um, uh, depend on relationships rather than um, substance, to be right. quite honest. Mm -hmm. And so with the lack of, of certainty, with the fog that, that really is um, upon us, and just trying to navigate from day to day, a plan really is the best way to have some sense of direction. And so today we are sponsored by the Sales Territory Planning Program, uh, which Russ mentioned at the beginning of, of our session. And you know, if the idea of, of planning, of negotiating your number, of trying to figure out how to get your sales team uh, to sell better um, virtually, to penetrate new accounts, we know from the data that 70% of sales organizations find prospecting and lead gen to be one of their top challenges. Yes. So, you know, to, um, to bring some clarity and direction to your sales team for 2021, we would highly recommend checking out sales territory planning. And so producer Rich is going to put up an email address if you're interested in learning more. Um, but if figuring out how to hit next year's number is scarier than a deserted road on <laughs> Halloween, I had to get that pun in there, guys. Uh, but this workshop might be uh, for you and your team. And it's really one of my favorite uh, workshops here. It's hands-on. Your team will put together plans for whatever that number ends up being. We know that some folks are going to have numbers that are higher than they really feel comfortable with. So breaking that number down, understanding where that business is going to come from, building action plans 
for those target accounts that you want to penetrate, for uh, the, the key accounts and those growth accounts that you want to retain and expand, uh, check out sales territory planning because this could be the program uh, that will set you on the right path for 2021. Well, Michelle, you made a good point because business development is a, is a buzz, buzzwords we're hearing now because people right. need to bring in more new business. So it helps in making time for that when you look yeah. at this program. Yeah. Well, Russ, what you got for us? All right. Well, <laughs> I, I found this um, paradox and uh, or stock was called the Stockdale Paradox. And uh, I had maybe seen it before, but I'd forgotten it. And, and in this, he basically says, you know, we have to be careful that we don't confuse, um, uh, you know, faith, that is, we, we're sure we're going to get through this with just kind of the reality of the moment. And he tells a story from his time when he was a POW in Vietnam that, uh, you know, in the midst of that cruelty and isolation and beatings and, and pain that the optimists were the ones who said, oh, well, we'll be home by Christmas or we'll be home by Easter or we'll be home by Thanksgiving. And, um, and then he said they ultimately were the ones who would die first. They were the ones who died of the broken hearts. Uh, and so um, I, I just thought this is a great story and fit for where we are in 20, uh, right now as we think about 2021, because we both want to know that we're going to get through this, uh, but at the same time, we have to grasp the, the reality of the moment. So what are some things that we can do? Um, number one, as you're starting to build your plan for 2021, go broader than you normally do in terms of getting input for that plan. Um, I would challenge you that if you normally talk to, to, to your team, talk to you know, other groups of folks in the organization. If you normally talk to everybody in your organization, go talk to partners in terms of what they're seeing. Um, one of the things we've talked about is the idea that decisions right now are being driven by data. Uh, and that can be a scary word because a lot of people maybe don't have the analytical systems in place to give them lots of reports. But the data is just talking to folks, having conversations and understanding what they're hearing. Uh, I worked for a company one time that when we got ready to do our annual planning, uh, we were always struggling. And I happened to have a conversation with the person in purchasing. And they said, oh, well, we have an entire model that predicts our demand. Uh, and we went and looked at it. They had better analytics and tools than, than we did in the sales group. Um, and when I said, well, why haven't you ever shared this with sales? They said, well, nobody ever asked. You know, we, we had them, but it wasn't that big a deal. So um, ask around. Also look for, uh, for external partners, suppliers, distributors, those who make complementary products. Um, if you're a distributor, talk to your manufacturers and what they're seeing. There are people on both sides of you in the food chain that can help you with your plan. Uh, and then the last one is, I'd say, pay special attention to the, to the insurgents. Those who are who are being more successful than other folks in your organization uh, and ask the question why. And uh, I wanna caution you here. One of the things that I'll see in these reviews sometimes is the answer will be, well, they're just a special case or well, you know, that um, we're doing everything right. But, but if that's the case that you always look like it's right and they're just a special case, get back in and ask the questions again. I usually find that there's things to be learned when you look at the people who are being successful now. Uh, second of all, I'd say, you know, don't confuse goals with strategies. We, we all have a goal. We have a fixed target, right? We want to get in a plane and we want to fly from point A to point B. Uh, but the strategy is the route. It's how we choose to get there. Um, you know, we could, we could fly, you know, east to west. We could fly west to east. We could fly north. We could fly south in the way we go it. Um, so you want to make sure with strategy, you're answering the question of, you know, how do I get there? And so if this year you've missed the goal or you've blown the goal out, um, the question really needs to be is, are we doing the right things? If you watched in the, uh, the recent uh, baseball playoffs, um, uh, one of the, 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 the commentaries that was rolling through the whole thing was, you know, this person isn't getting a lot of hits right now, but they're hitting the ball hard. And so they're doing the right things. They just aren't yet getting the goal of the hit or the results. And so ask yourself, is my strategy right? Are we doing the right things? Um, for example, uh, one of the things we're seeing right now is for 2021, companies are planning that a bigger percentage of their revenue is going to come from existing customers than it's going to come from new customers because of the difficult with business development and our customers desire not necessarily to have to change vendors. Um, and so the question might be is, um, you know, is, is my mix of, of quote unquote farmers right with hunters? Do I need to reskill? Do I need to, to do some training about how to get more out of existing accounts? 
Um, you may need to change the strategy. It's not going to change the goal. Um, number three, fix something. Uh, every VP or sales leader I know has a list of things that his people complain about. Just pick one and fix it. Um, I was thinking about a story. I worked for a company one time, a very large company who will remain nameless, uh, but they bounced one of my expense reports uh, because um, I had exceeded by $2 the amount that I was supposed to spend according to policy on dinner. And uh, if you think about it, it routed from accounting to the controller to my boss, who was the VP. And it just turned out the day it showed up, the division president came to visit us. And he was sitting in my boss's office and he said to him, what can I do to help? And my boss flipped the expense report at him and just said, help me not have to deal with this kind of stuff. And so the, the president picked up the report, walked into the controller's office, and he said five words. He said, use common sense, pay it. You probably have some simple things like that that you can deal with that would solve problems for your people. And just doing that uh, is going to help them. And so just figure out one. It doesn't have to be expensive, but help them get there. Uh, we had a question that came in uh, through that. What percent? Um, we're seeing, again, it depends on the industry, uh, but the overall average is usually about two-thirds of a company's revenue is going to come from existing clients. That's shifting maybe to mid 70s. So maybe uh, they're seeing on average a, a 10 to 12% greater percentage coming from existing clients than from new clients. Uh, but again, that varies a whole lot by industry. And then uh, uh, the last one is uh, think about kind of how you build your revenue plan around customer success and really around these two questions. Um, what customers, uh, what do customers need to be successful and how uh, well positioned, I have a typo there, sorry, are we to meet that need? And, and when I say that, um, a lot of times we think about, well, how much can we get out of our customers? What's going to be the fit? How are we going to succeed? But if we turn around and ask the question, are we aligned with our customer's success? Um, then I think we're going to find it going easier than if we sort of have to push upstream. So let's talk about how we build that number then. So here's kind of um, where I think sales managers sit. You sit between executive leadership. You sit between the sales team. Um, uh, you know, the executive leadership, they, they want results. They want a big number. But I always tell my classes in sales management, they want predictability. Um, they want to be able for you to say, here's the number I'm going to get and get it. And now is your chance to make sure that, that that's real. I, I am... I did some consulting work with a client one time and, uh, and they dictated back. They said, well, this is what we want the sales number to be. And I went and talked to the salespeople and they said, well, here's what the number is going to be. And there was a big gap. And so I went back to them. I said, here's what your number, your bottom line, you know, guaranteed number is. And, and then they're going to try and grow from that. And they said, well, that's unacceptable. And then I said, well, okay, it is unacceptable, but that's what your number is. Do you want reality or do you just want a number you made up? Now, as a consultant, you can be maybe a little more aggressive. And, and I recognize that you're, clientele is going to matter here because, um, excuse me, your culture, if you've got a culture where you can speak honestly and openly with your leaders, it's going to be a lot better than if, uh, than if you can't. So how do you do it? Here's the process I've used over and over again. Uh, hopefully it'll be helpful. Start with a bottoms up number, talk to the team, but not just here's the number I think, break it out. Here's what percent of my number I think I can get from new accounts. Here's what I'm going to get from just sort of run rate business. Here's where I'm going to get from growth and realize that you're always going to have some loss of accounts. They say most business to business companies lose somewhere between 12 and 14% a year of their existing clients and existing revenue rate. So think about kind of that negative as you start to put the rest of these together. Um, it's important here to ask a lot of questions to understand how the territory is performing. What kind of accounts bases do they have that's different? How long have they been in their sales territory? The more data you can learn here, the better you have a feel for it, the easier it's going to be to go have the conversation with management. Number two, um, usually there's then a top down number that comes through. It's either built by finance, built by marketing, maybe built around market share or growth targets. Um, when you have that number, I would encourage you to also ask a lot of questions about what their assumptions are. Where are they building it? Are they assuming product growth? Are they assuming ge geographic growth? Um, you get the chance or you have to defend your number by answering questions. You're not challenging those upper numbers, but you really want to understand it. You want to see where are the assumptions different 
because then you can have a conversation about the assumptions and where they're right or wrong, not necessarily about the numbers, which tend to be sort of, you know, more, uh, more fixed. Um, then we used to always do a second pass from the bottoms up. What new products, new initiative? Do we get new headcount? Is there going to be territory reorg? Um, I, I spoke to a client a couple of weeks ago who said that that his team in an area had said, no, we've got every client co there's you know covered. Um, we're getting our share. You know, we just don't see anything other than just sort of small growth. All of a sudden, one of the salespeople left. They brought in a new person. That new person is up 20% over the previous um, salesperson, and most of it is around new accounts. And so challenge some of the assumptions there to really see kind of where you're at. Um, in that case, you come back with a number, uh, probably adjusted, take it to management, and then have the conversation. And, and as I like to say, you know, you're, you're in sales. So this is a chance for us to practice our selling skills. Sit down and have the conversation that says, here's the things that are, that are really critical that we do. Um, and then where there's gaps, ask how they can help. We always talk about when there's a problem, the more you can involve uh, both sides in solving it, the better. And so when they come back and say, no, this is what the number is going to be, you're going to say, okay, but I'm going to need help here. I'm going to need help there. Um, and then a philosophical thing for me, when you get the number, uh, assign the number, you know, put a, put maybe a small bump on it, but, but don't, add percentages to every layer so that by the time the person in the field gets the number, it's 25% greater than the company number. Um, you know, and, and make sure you assign all the quota. I've seen places where the, the VP of sales has held out what he calls the mine number, which, well, I'll take care of that, or the steep ramp number. And, and all of those things just, you know, paint a bad picture. Put the number in front of people. You can always uh, my wife used to work for IBM and they would always go in and do minor adjustments at mid-year uh, if um, they were doing things to, uh, to, to make sure the company made its number in different product lines. Um, I know it's a tough negotiation, both with management and with your team. Expect it to take times. Uh, ask questions. You know, one of the things you can ask is like, look, this is going to be a stretch given 2021. Um, can, we, can we bump the accelerator? If somebody overperforms, can we, can we pay them extra for that overperformance? Um, think about ways to motivate them. And uh, uh, if um, one of the ultimate things that always works is to ask management, how willing are they to tie their compensation to whatever that sales compensation number is? And again, if you're in the right culture where you can do that, that gets everybody pulling together. If the execs have a number that's 15% less than you've assigned in sales quota, um, you're, you're in the same boat, but, but some of you are on, you know, the Lido deck and some of the rest of you are in steerage. And then finally, just kind of a couple of quick thoughts here in passing. Um, go ahead and, and, and uh, Michelle, if you want to advance the next slide there, uh, make some decisions, right? Be crisp, be clear. Right now, uncertainty is, is concerning everybody. Uh, we can sit here and come up with a list of 15 things that, that we're uncertain about. Um, but if you make some hard decisions, it starts to remove that uncertainty. It allows you to clarify what it is that you're doing and gives you some direction and movement. And I always like to say it's easier to steer momentum than to get something started from a dead stop. Um, be very clear about your priorities. Uh, I like to say, and I've said it on this, this webinar before, uh, most people don't have a time management issue. They have a priority management issue. And what I see in the planning is, um, you just keep adding pieces to make the business more complex. And I don't believe 2021 is a year for complexity. So think about the things you're going to do and the things you're not going to do. Uh, I, I worked for a company one time when I got there, they had 3,600 products in their catalog. And I did an analysis and 300 of those, so 5% generated 92% of the revenue. And so, um, uh, the, you know, one team, the sales team wanted as big a catalog as they could get. But the rest of the organization was saying, wow, there's a cost of forecasting, manage bombs, hold these in stock, everything else. Uh, and so we started a process to clean those up. Uh, we didn't get all the way to 300. We got to about 350, if I remember right. Uh, but after a lot of work, what it allowed us to do is to um, put cash on the balance sheet and give us more focus as an organization. Uh, and then the last part is just, um, well, okay, a plan for unforeseen events. No one could have predicted 2020 but you can predict some scenarios. What happens is if a competitor uh, you know, gets real aggressive on price? What happens if they disappear or they get acquired? 
what happens if the pandemic goes deeper than we expect in a year? What happens if the vaccine arrives sooner? Um, think about how you can build your model dynamically uh, as you go along and make changes. Uh, and then the last one is just make sure you've got a, re a release, a review cadence. Um, the sales territory planning class we're talking about is a great one. If you do plans, you put them in a drawer and you never look at them, they're not plans, it's a waste. Um, so make sure you've got a cadence, make sure you've got a system where you're looking at those plans periodically. You're asking about, are we doing the right activities for today, strategies for today, our objectives for today results. We call that uh, in process management. Um, uh, Nick Saban doesn't coach by just looking at the final scoreboard to see how well Alabama played. He looks at every single step along the way to see where they can execute further. Uh, a place to stop, look at your conversion ratios. How many leads do you get? How many become opportunities? Uh, how many become closed one? Uh, and monitor those. As those numbers go up or down, it has a real impact on the bottom line. So make sure you've got a release cadence. That's our thoughts on how to plan for a difficult 2021. Any questions that we can take as we wrap up? And while we're waiting for questions to come in, I wanna thank Lisa for being here and I'm sure she can help, uh, help us answer any questions that come in. Uh, and to, to remind you all that uh, if you're interested in the sales territory planning program, and it is a virtual workshop, uh, to email contact at thebrooksgroup.com. So kind of sum up where we are, we're a little over time. Um, you know, get as much input as you can into the plan, review goals and strategies, but don't confuse in terms of, of where you are, even what you ended up with in 2020. Fix something, um, your team will appreciate it and love it. Build revenue from understanding how you're helping your customers succeed. Write down the plan, set clear priorities, review it. And uh, that more than anything else. And by the way, writing down the plan is not just for your team, but that data that you gather becomes part of how you help uh, management understand kind of where you are, what the constraints are, where the opportunities are. Um, they all become input into that presentation that you're going to make uh, to your boss who ultimately sets the number. And thank you, Russ. It doesn't look like we have any questions that have come in. Um, okay. Our next, our next um, webinar will be on Friday the 13th. We're going from uh, Halloween Friday. to <laughs> Friday the 13th, huh? <laughs> and oh the my. scariness <laughs> continues, right? So we'll, uh, we'll be talking about remote coaching. Uh, so another hot topic, especially since we expect the, um, the virtual environment to continue for a little while. And uh, again, thank, thank you everyone for joining. Thank you, Lisa, for your insights. Sure. It was wonderful to have you. We'll hopefully have you back again. Yes. All right. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all. <laughs>